We're going to talk about love now, okay? Because I think any view of ancient Greek thought that doesn't talk about love is completely incomplete. As Russell put it, the good life is the life guided by reason and inspired by love. In his novel uh, Siddhartha, Hermann Hesse has the main character, Siddhartha, after a lifetime of spiritual searching, telling his old friend Govinda, you're going to laugh at this doctrine, Govinda, but I think that love is the most, single most important thing in the world. Okay, now, in contemporary English, the word love is so uh, ambiguous that it's almost useless for communication. I know it seems kind of silly. Somebody says, I love you, to say, what do you mean by that? But, um, but the fact is, you don't necessarily know what they mean by it. You know? The teacher loves his students. Well, does that mean you should call the police, or does that mean he's a, he's a real good guy? <laughs> right? Uh, you love pizza, and you also love God, and you also love your children. Presumably, you don't mean the same thing in the same way. Okay? The ter English language term love is very, very, very broad. It's so fuzzy that, in fact, it's almost useless at this point without further elaboration. Uh, counselors, particularly high school counselors, will often say this is a source of lots of conflicts between teenage boys and teenage girls. What, are, what do you actually mean when you ask, do you love me? And what do you actually mean when you say, you love me? If, you don't, if you're, you're talking past each other, if you, don't, if you don't get more clear about that. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the Greek, ancient Greek conception of, of love, which is broken down into several different things, as it is in most cultures. Right? In, uh, for instance, in, in Indian Buddhism, there is no word for love. There are words for compassion, for being happy for another person's happiness, for being friendly toward all beings toward you know, loving kindness, being peaceable toward, toward all beings. There are different words for that. Physical desire is listed with the appetites. It's not even listed with, <laughs> with, with those, with those uh, divine abodes, as they're called. It's listed with the appetites, because that's what it is. And they were smart enough to realize the fact that you know, I desire someone physically doesn't mean I care about them, or vice versa. Okay? They, may come to get, they may happen at the same time, or they may not. Um, the Greeks also understood that better than I think we do. We talk a whole lot about love in our society and we rarely, we rarely actually explain what we mean by that or understand that there are several different kinds of things we could mean. Love is a relationship. There's a lover and there's the beloved. And love is the relationship between them. Now the Greeks like to talk about eros and agape as two different kinds of love. Eros is love based on desire. Okay. Now, because it's, uh, it's you know, cognate with our term erotic, very often when we see the word eros, we think immediately of you know, sexual desire. It's way, way, way more than that for the Greeks. Eros is love based on desire. You see something in the beloved that is worth desiring, and you desire it. Uh, psychologists often point out that the love of a newborn infant for its mother is almost entirely eros. Here is the source of comfort. Here is the source of relief from hunger. Here is the source of warmth. Okay? The, ch the infant doesn't have the cognitive ability to think, you know, I really hope that I'll make my mother happy eventually when I can finally talk and do things. Uh, no, the, it's just desire for what the mother gives. Agape, on the other hand, is love based on caring rather than on desire. Agape means that I want to give to you because I care about you. Part of my happiness is seeing you happy. Part of an, an indispensable part of my well-being is my promoting your well-being. That's agape. Okay? Now, <clears throat> it's not like eros is bad and agape is good. The two of them don't make any sense without each other. No matter what I want, if nobody wants to give anything, you know, my wants are going to go unanswered. I might as well not have them. And when I want something, when I see something about someone else that I think is desirable, whether it's their wisdom or their beauty or their ability to make a really great vegan dinner <laughs> or you know, their ability to make beautiful music or, or whatever, 
I'm honoring the beloved by having eros, by saying there is something about you that is worth desiring. There is something about you that, in fact, enhances my life. Okay? Agape without eros, the Greeks would have regarded as arrogance. I'm the one to give, but you don't have anything I want. Whoa, wait a minute. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a, a, a power dynamic game. Okay? You probably know some people who are very ready to give and be generous, but who go into a panic if you try to give anything back. That's all about power, not about generosity. I want to be in the superior position. I want to make it clear, you don't have anything that I want, but I have all these wonderful gifts that I could bestow on you. Doesn't that make me a better person than you? Even if the person isn't conscious of that, that's, what, that's the power dynamic of that relationship. Agape without eros is arrogance. Now, the ancient Greeks thought that the ideal situation was to have eros and agape in balance with each other. You have things that enhance my life, and I desire them. And I have things that I want to give to you because I care about you, and vice versa. For the Greeks, having eros and agape in balance was, that's the desired relationship, and if you can maintain that over time, that's philia. Okay? Philia is often translated as friendship. Real friends freely give to each other and freely receive from each other without keeping score. If you've got to keep score, something's already out of balance. Okay? You give to each other, you receive from each other. I value you and I honor you by, by acknowledging you have things, worthwhile things to give me, and you honor me and value me by, by acknowledging that I have valuable things to give to you. When that's in balance, over time, that is philia. And the Greeks held that philia, friendship, if you will, is the basis for positive long-term relationships. Okay? Eros without agape is just exploitation. You have something I want, I don't care if you're okay, just as long as I get what I want. Agape without, without eros is arrogance. Don't even try to give anything to me because, you know, I'm just, I'm the better person. But when the two are in balance and they're maintained in balance over time, that is friendship, that's philia. And that, for the Greeks, is the foundation of all ethics. Friendship is the foundation of all ethics for most Greek ethicists. The idea is the degree to which we can live as friends benefits all of us. The degree to which we have to live as adversaries hurts all of us. The good life is the life that maximizes philia. As Russell put it, guided by reason and inspired by love. Well, what about romantic love? Well, the Greeks knew about romantic love and actually they thought it was a form of mental illness. Okay? Think about it. What words do we use in popular culture to describe romantic love? Oh, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't think of anything but you. That's obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay? Uh, Sting, when he, back when he was a member of a band, I think it was the police, had a big hit. Every move that you make, every breath that you take, I'll be watching you. In an interview, he once said, That's really embarrassing. Not really, not simply because it's simply a, a patchwork quilt of lots of cliches from old rock songs, but also because it essentially is the narrative of a stalker. Every move that you make, every breath that you take, I'll be watching you. Now that's not love, that's obsession. That's, that's obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's scary. I'll die without you. No, actually, if you, if you can't live without me, then why aren't you already dead? <laughs> why didn't you die before you met me? Um, no, actually, you can. The question isn't whether you'll die without me, but rather whether you actually can relate to me in a way that makes it possible for us to positively live together. Um, <clears throat> the, Greeks, uh, the Greeks regarded romantic love as being similar to getting drunk. Okay? And they were not against getting drunk. Oh, I feel tipsy, I feel dizzy, Woo! I feel, oh, what's this rush I'm having? Yeah, then people describe romantic love in that way, and they describe, you know, they describe being inebriated in the same way, so yeah, it's like a form of drunkenness. And the Greeks said, fine, have fun with it, play with it, but don't dry, try to drive the chariot while you're drunk. Don't make any important lasting decisions 
while you're drunk. <laughs> okay? Likewise, if you're infatuated with someone, understand it's an infatuation. It's largely a physical craving. And don't treat it as more than that. If you can, out of that, develop real friendship, now you've got the basis for a relationship. But if it's just craving, craving's not the basis for a relationship. Um, people who study the biology of romantic love, yes, there are people who have studied that extensively, say that what actually what happens is when you're very physically attracted to someone, the person's body is giving off chemical cues that your body's picking up on at a, you know, below the threshold of what you can perceive. You know, chemical cues, like, you know, even from their, how different their immune system is from you, okay, <laughs> from yours. Uh, that's triggering your brain to f flush itself with opiates. That's why you feel dizzy and intoxicated around someone who you're romantically, uh, romantically excited by. Okay. Now, they've also found that it takes usually about three years before your body is so acclimated to the other person that you're not getting the dopamine rush anymore. Hmm. So by the end of that three years, either you have, you have developed philia, you have developed a relationship out of that, or, you know, it's like an old blues song, you know, the fire's out, I gotta move on. The person who's saying that is a dopamine addict. Right? I never did love you, I love the rush. And now I'm not getting the rush, I'm gonna go find it someplace else. Okay, um, the Greeks understood that that way lies madness. That's a kind of addiction. What we really need to figure out is to do, if we really are going to base our relationships on love, if we're gonna base uh, our personal relationships and our social institutions upon love that respects other people, then we have to go through the tough work of learning how to be friends. Okay? Being a friend means honoring the beloved as having things that are worthwhile, having characteristics that are worthwhile and that will enhance your life, and also being willing to give of the best of yourself to enhance the life of the beloved. Okay? Why do you come back out of the sun into the cave in Plato's allegory of the cave. Because now you realize you are the sun. What does the sun do? It sheds its light and it sheds its warmth on everyone equally to the extent that they're willing to turn and face the sun. So the hard work of trying to live well means that you have to, uh, as the, the world's great religions have been telling us for millennia, you actually have to learn how to love your fellow beings. Okay, and that completes it.